All right, that should be enough, I think. Um, everyone will trickle in. Um, again, welcome. Welcome to the um, Paper Tiger webinar, uh, Q&A. Um, so, you know, obviously in this time, we thought it would be good to put something together and um, share, share all our knowledge. So, um, you know, now's a good time for, you know, to just keep, a, keep thinking about supporting the class um, so with uh, renewing your memberships and stuff. I know we're coming into the winter here, but um, when the time comes, um, make sure you get your uh, memberships in. They're not, they're not a great deal of money and uh, it, it helps out the class um, quite a lot, you know, so um, make sure that all happens. So today we've got um, Mark Orams and myself, everyone, uh, most of you will know Mark, obviously he's been in the Paper Tiger fleet for quite a few years, had a couple of um, hiatus years, but uh, back and forth now. And um, you all know me, obviously from North Sales. Right, so we had quite a few of the questions, um, quite a few questions saying, how did you get to where we are with our sail designs? And um, we thought we'd run through a bit of a time frame of, of um, where we started and what, what we did. Um, so as you can see there in 2013, Marco's sort of year into the class and um, had tried a bunch of other sales um, and coming up with some different different ideas uh, came, came and um, approached us and was keen to sort of try out what we had. Um, we, we did some uh, Dacron designs beforehand and uh, gave one to Mark and um, he went away and pretty much uh, pulled it apart and um, gave us some comments and um, we made quite a few changes. Um, I'll get Mark to chime on in and, uh, you know, to, to, to t tell us where we sort of, what, what we did different and um, where we got to. Yeah, thanks, Des. Um, yeah, kia ora, kia ora everybody, uh, especially to our trans-Tasman cousins over the ditch there. Um, welcome to Aussie PT Sailors. Uh, nice for you to join us. and. Um, to all the Kiwi PT sailors as well. We're, we're looking forward to getting back on the water soon now that we're allowed to here. Um, so just a couple of things in terms of the, the thinking, and this really, I guess, underlies the philosophy of the development of the North Sales design and the further refinements. Um, sometimes when you come into a class and you don't know anything about it, you sort of look at things and wonder why they are the way they are. And it was a bit like that for me when I came into the PT, um, the first thing I noticed is just how baggy and, and terrible the sails looked on the shore. Um, and the immediate answer as to why that was the case is because the rigs were so soft. So um, with a, a rig that bent a lot in sailing conditions, you needed to have a sail that had a lot of luff around, a lot of seam shape um, to deal with that rig. And then the more I looked at, at the rig, the more I realized what a piece of spaghetti it was. And if you look across other sailing classes, um, I challenge you to find any other sailing class with a, an alloy pear-shaped rig um, that's 20 feet tall or you know, over, around six meters tall uh, and doesn't have either spreaders or diamonds to provide some lateral stiffness. And if you combine that with the ability to rotate the mast, um, we've, we've ended up in the Paper Tiger with an incredibly soft mast that's quite difficult to control um, and that also explains why what I was confused about when I first got into the class which was why so many guys were breaking their rigs and basically the upper wind limit for sailing the PT was about 22 23 knots which I just thought was a bit soft to be quite frank um, and, and so the, the reason when I started to ask around for that was just because so many people broke rigs at the, um, at the bottom hounds position, uh, downwind cartwheeling. Uh, and the more I sort of sailed the boat without, with that really soft rig, the more I found it very difficult 
to keep the boat on the pace. At times I was going fast, other times I'd really fall out of it and be going slow. And I just got quite frustrated. Um, so the answer to me was just to make a stiffer rig and then to try and design a sail to meet that stiffer rig. So my first effort at that was actually to use a, an old broken paper tiger mast and to cut the mast track off it. And then I actually jammed it up the bottom of my new mast um, with a hydraulic car jack and uh, and so it, it went up there and I immediately found some gains from that uh, but in doing that the sails that we were using at that time which were really deep quite soft Dacron sails just weren't working so that really led me down the path of talking to Derek and the North Sales guys about how we might make a sail that was more even in shape um, flatter and more efficient uh, that could suit this new stiffer mast. So that, that was sort of the, the whole basis for the path that we've gone down. Um, and everything since has really been just little refinements of that. But what you'll see in the, the bullet point here under 2015 is one of the trade-offs with having a stiffer rig like that is that it was a lot heavier. And in sailing the Paper Tiger, I just noticed how bouncy they were because they're quite high volume for a catamaran. And in any kind of sea state, having that heavier mast was a real disadvantage. So that was the reason that I started to look down the path of, well, if, I, if I'm struggling to make progress forward, maybe I can make the mast a little bit lighter, but keep the stiffness. So that led us down the path of looking at carbon stiffness. And then the Dacron <laughs> sail with the, um, at that stage, blue streak fiberglass battens was also very heavy. So that led us down the path of looking into lighter sailcloth options and carbon plate batten options. So that was sort of the, the beginning in 2015 of the stealth designs, which are prefixed by the S. Uh, the S4 was the first, uh, which most of us have had. And then we've uh, subsequently, Derek developed the S5 and we've been working recently on the S6. So there's a little bit of history about um, the thinking that lay behind these designs uh, and what we've done since. Now I'll just move to this next slide um, and I'll sort of explain what, um, what Marco was talking about with the, um, what, what we used to have or what the sales and masts used to be like and some are still and, um, and kind of what we are at already at now with the stiffness um, and both of these options work in a different way and that's what you know we're just going to be talking about of um, matching uh, matching the sails to the mass you know it doesn't really matter if you have a stiffener or not as long as you can um, talk to your sail maker and get the sail to match the mass and how it bends So yeah, um, with moving to the, the mile hour and the carbon battens, we've, we saved nearly uh, or over a kilo of weight um, and then moving to some small detail changes in the, um, in the, in the S5, um, we think we've shaved a bit more off that as well. Um, the work that we've been doing on the, um, on the S6, which is trying to get something fuller and more powerful is um, still ongoing. There's been a few, a few small changes um, over the time and I'll scroll down. As you can see here, the, the difference in the um, three designs that we've, we've had, the, um, the S4 was our first generation of the Mylar sail. Um, there was obviously cry pretty quickly um, to have something deeper and, and a little bit more powerful, which is um, where the S5 got to. Um, and then moving to the S6. Um, the, the, just the photo of the S6 is um, not sailing and there's not a lot of wind in it, so it sort of skews the perspective of it there. Um, the other two are sailing shots. Um, and about 12 knots. So um, 
that sort of looks a little bit the s6 probably looks a little bit deeper and rounder than it than it probably would if it was actually sailing just just to sort of perhaps point out for you the things to look at the difference between the s4 and the s5 is quite subtle <laughs> um if you're looking up them at the moment but the, the key thing is that the S5 is slightly deeper in the top third of the sail, so towards the head, and, and it has a, a, a slightly rounder exit. So um, that's something that, that helps a lot in terms of um, the ability to generate height, but it does make it more sensitive to main sheet tension. So the S4 was sort of a set and forget sail. Um, it was something that was designed and at my sort of brief really, I wanted a sail that I was able to just sheet on and go and then get my head out of the boat and, and look up the course and try and figure out the fastest way to get around the racetrack as opposed to having my head in the boat trying to get my uh, boat in the right mode to, to be fast enough. I got quite frustrated in my first season of sailing the PT of, as I mentioned before, sort of sometimes being fast and sometimes not and, and having to constantly adjust things. So that S4 design was quite deliberately um, very even in its shape, but quite straight in the exit. But the S5 uh, allows a little bit more drive because you can see with the, the green shape, so it goes from flat, goes from the darker shades through to the pinker shades for, and redder shades for deep. Um, and you can see that the depth in the S5 is carried forward and aft in the sail. And this explains for those of you who've, who've noticed the difference, why the S5 seems to generate a little bit more height and a little bit more power, especially in the sort of marginal hull flying conditions than the S4. Yeah, the other thing that we did to try and compensate or help with that is um, just put a bit more angle on the, on the battens. Um, as you can, as you as you know from our sails, um, especially the S4, the battens are quite horizontal compared to um, uh, your traditional Dacron sail, which um, which is good. You know, there was like Mark was saying, there was the brief of making an automatic sail, which um, having the battens horizontal will um, help the leech open, so you don't doesn't require so much main sheet um, alteration. Um, but the problem there is, especially for the heavier guys, or if you don't want the sail to open that early, then you can't control that because um, they're more, you know, the horizontal uh, angle on them. So raising the um, battens by, the, especially the top uh, three, by about three degrees, sort of just close that leech. Um, a little bit more and held it closed a little bit longer. If you needed to ease um, or open the leech, you'd just have to ease the main sheet. So the S5 is um, a little bit more tweakier, you know, it does require a bit more trimming um, than, than the S4, but, um, but in turn it creates a lot more power. And obviously with what Mark said there with the shape, as you can see, um, the shape and further um, further in the back of the sail here, which holds that up as well. The, and then, the beauty about that design though, um, is of course what, what we can do and what we're seeing in the breeze is you can still flatten it out. Um, you can do it by um, pulling on your downhaul and that's going to uh, open your leech uh, because it bends your mast more. Uh, and similarly, you, you can, uh, rotate your mast a little bit more and you can ease sheet a little bit more. So you can get rid of the power when you want to in a breeze. Um, these three, three photos here are actually of the S6, uh, but again, just to put it in context, this was in my driveway just last week with no breeze in it, hence the my daughter's hand you can see on the left um, in the clue patch, uh, just holding it out. But it just demonstrates how much we can change and how versatile the sail is um, with sail controls. So the, the light air setup is very, very deep, probably too deep actually on that left-hand image. And then you can see the reduction in both um, the depth of the sail uh, and also in terms of where the draft sits, uh, the maximum draft point in the sail in the middle image. And then if you look 
dramatically on the right, you can see with all controls on how you can just completely blade the sail out and that's with no breeze in it at all. So you can have something which is the same sail on the same rig, uh, but with the difference in your controls, change it dramatically from uh, the shape that it has on the, on the left image all the way through to the image on the right. Yeah, and that's um, that's what we found when we moved to the the S5 as well, and it obviously um, didn't quite go as far as we first thought. You know, the sails can still be um, flattened out quite a lot uh, with the controls that we got, um, so they tend to be quite quite a versatile sail. So just to add in on the S6, because this is, um, as Derek said, something we're still working on. So um, obviously I've got this sail. Um, I'm looking for a sail that's just got a little bit more drive in it. Um, but at the moment, we're still working on matching it to the rig. So it's not quite there yet. Um, I'm, it's not that the sail's not there yet. Uh, our work, uh, more specifically my work in trying to match it to the way I've set up the rig is still a work in progress. It's all very well doing it on the beach or in the driveway in this case, but um, you really need to get out sailing to see how it performs. And here in New Zealand, we've not been able to sail for the last um, eight weeks. So uh, there's been no opportunity for me to really just get the mast right so that the sail is right. But it just re-emphasizes the point that we started with is that your mast sail combination is critical. You can't just whack a new sail on your existing mast and expect it to go quick straight out of the bag. Um, the things need to be matched together. And the sail makers are all aware of that and, and working uh, work with you on that and developing uh, your new sail. All right. So we thought we'd just quickly whip through the uh, main controls on the sail. Um, there's been quite a few questions that relate to these so we'll probably cross off a lot um, of the questions as we go here um, so um, a couple of questions we've had is uh, how how much main sheet tension do we do, should i be using upwind um, especially in the sort of medium conditions um, and and for me i tend to use a fair amount of main sheet tension um, we've got the leech ribbons on the back of the main to to show you when the sail has been stalled out. But especially with the S4 sail, um, we found it well. I found it fairly quite hard to um, to stall, um, especially if you're sitting on the side. Once it gets a bit lighter, you do need to be careful on how much um, on how much main sheet tension you have. Um, so so the um, so yeah, so there, there's that there. Um, yeah, another thing I'd just add as a tip to that. Um, for me, one of the guides I use for main sheet tension is, is how I'm going relative to the boats around me. Um, so, you know, if I'm finding I'm higher and slower, um, I'll tend to just ease main sheet a little bit. If I find I'm going lower and faster, uh, then I'll tend to bring in a little bit more main sheet. I found early on again in sailing in the class, I kind of got a bit lost with main sheet tension. It was hard for me to get the feel right. So what I actually did, and I still do it to this day, is, is I actually have a permanent marker um, mark on my main sheet where it goes through the turning block on the boom before it comes down to the ratchet block on the, um, on the tramp. And I use that as my guide so that I know where I'm at um, with regard to that mark. I can tell whether I'm sort of really highly sheeted on tight or whether I'm a little bit loose compared to sort of an average setting. And I'm a bit of, I'm, I'm a believer in having marks for different settings. Um, and that way you know where you are or else you can quite, you can get quite lost. Just looking down this list here, there are a huge number of variables there, right? And, and every time you change something, it affects other things. So having marks on everything and understanding if you are got a good setup one day or even on one beat or one training session lineup, um, remember where your settings are and put those in a logbook. So I have a logbook I keep religiously about my settings um, and you know the, the work list and that kind of thing as well. 
so so that that's a systematic way of trying to step forward as opposed to just going out sailing and kind of thinking, well, I was going quick yesterday, but I'm not going quick today and not really understanding why or, or having a base from which to try and move forward. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And I have a book as well, the, all the different, different um, uh, positions of things and, and what felt good on what days and also what conditions they were in as well, which, um, you know, so you can kind of mimic, for, mimic it for the, um, for your next regatta if you get in similar conditions or look through the book and see see what's uh, there and mm. with the traveler i kind of feel like it goes kind of hand in hand with the main sheet um you can, uh most of the conditions until i start getting overpowered the traveler's fairly close to the middle and once it gets really light i tend to drop it a little bit just so the sail the boat and the sail don't get so bound up um and then once the once the breeze starts really kicking um the traveler goes lower and lower um that way you can kind of um you can kind of you know as the breeze picks up and the um and the traveler goes down you can kind of keep the main sheet on um like we all know if you um if you get a big gust and you have to ease the main sheet um the boat sort of rears up or, or or struggles a little bit it eventually spills power um but the boat slows down quite a lot um so so having them keeping the main sheet on and um having the traveler down um 300 300 mils in the in the really windy stuff even more um depending on your weight and how 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 much you know you're struggling to keep the boat flat yeah i think the other thing that's influential there is how flat or bumpy the water is so generally speaking the, the more <laughs> waves there are um the more you want your traveler down a little bit uh and the flatter it is the more you can kind of bring your traveler up and take take a little bit more height uh, as I mentioned before, the paper tiger for a catamaran is quite a lot of buoyancy forward. So as you all know, you, you tend to chop wood a little bit. So you're quite bouncy over waves. And they every wave that your, your hulls punch through, it's usually if you fly in a hull, your, your lured bow punches through, slows you down. So you need to be able to sail around waves and having your traveler lower allows you to do that without having to dump your main sheet all the time. As soon as you dump your main sheet, you take the, the tension off your leech, which releases mass bend, which in turn deepens up your sail, takes your draft forward, and doing the things that you don't want it to do. So you, you're not actually accelerating in a puff. What you're doing is easing main sheet and slowing in a puff. So um, another reason to, if you're overpowered, particularly in waves, is to have your traveler lower and your settings such that you don't have to completely dump your main sheet every time a puff hits you. Yep, yep. Um, all right, we'll move down to the outhaul. Well, I've kind of narrowed that down to four settings. Um, maximum off, which is um, what I'd only use for medium ear reaching. Um, and I've kind of worked out about 200 mil of depth but in the middle of the boom uh, to the sail. Um, and then kind of come, in, come on um, in about 50 mil increments until, until the foot's strapped on the boom and the really windy stuff. Um, so pretty simple there. I have, again, like what Mark was saying, I have marks on the outhaul. I have um, a knot with a bobble, so I can just sort of uncleat the outhaul at the top mark um, if I'm going onto the reach to, to ease it out to its um, desired place or its maximum out, outhaul place for maximum power. Um, and then you know the time that time you bring the outhaul on is going to be different for every 
every person depending on how deep your sail is and how heavy you are but um, if you can work out three or four basic um, settings then it, it does make it a lot easier. There's also another little trick the, with the outhaul if you um, if you give it quite a lot of ease going up when it will round up the back of the sail and give you quite good height but but not very good speed. Um, so if you're not too far from the top mark and you're struggling to lay, you can kind of give the outhaul a, quite a bit of ease and it might just make might just get you up to that mark rather than having to do two tacks. It's not going to be fast, but it'll be faster than um, faster than two tacks as we know. And moving on to Cunningham. Is something I learned pretty quickly and used quite a lot of. Um, as uh, as soon as I'm struggling to to keep the boat flat, um, the Cunningham's coming on, and um, it's actually with the sails that we've uh, designed, it actually makes quite a big difference. So you just need quite small small movements of the Cunningham. Um, you should be able to. Um, you know, a couple of times in the in the sort of steady breeze when the gust comes down, you can kind of hold the main sheet in the tiller hand and nearly play the Cunningham um, and to just to see how it how it works and um, how much how much of effect it does have on on depowering the sail. Um, so that the, as as the breeze comes on, I'm, I'm pulling the Cunningham on um, until it's it's you know I'm wrapping it around my heart hand and pulling it nearly as hard as I can. Anything more on that, uh, Marco? No, but uh, what what you'll notice if you really crank your cunning or your downhaul on is that the top third of your sail it pretty much lets go. So when it's really fresh, you're sailing off really the 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 bottom third to half of your sail is really what's giving you drive. Um, which is what you want uh, because you want to get rid of the power up high and that's what the Cunningham allows you to do. It's interesting is that it's not actually um, having a huge influence in these much stiffer sails uh, in changing the shape of your sail. What it's doing is it's bending your mast. So even on the beach you can watch that. If you crank your Cunningham or downhaul on, it actually bends your mast and that's what mm -hmm. opens, flattens your sail and opens your leech at the top. One thing that you should be careful of or mindful of is um, again how you're going against the other other boats around you. Um, if it's quite a windy day and, and they seem to be going a lot higher, um, just just check it if check your Cunningham and see if, if you've got um, because if you've got too much Cunningham on, like Mark said, sort of lets the whole top of the leech go. Um, which, which will uh, suffer your your height will suffer because of that. So, if you can um, just sort of fine tune it with the boats that are around you to to either match or or get better height if you can still hold the boat flat. Um, there's obviously those options there to you know always always sort of fine tuning. So the the Vang. And with the paper tiger, the van kind of <laughs> compared to other boats is um, fairly obsolete for upwind sailing, um, especially because you've got the traveller right at the back of the boat, right at the back of the boom, which controls a lot of um, a lot of your leech tension compared to a van um, compared to a van on a on a normal normal type of boat. Um, one thing. I do use the Vang for is um, as if I've um, overstood the top mark um, and I'm not looking at tacking again. Um, I'll use the Vang and ease the main a little bit. That way it's kind of Vang sheeting. It's going to hold the boom down. You're going to hold the power. And we all know as soon as you sort of drop trav or ease main, um, you know, you're going to, you, you, 
your boat's going to pick up and um, and and you'll get a lot more speed. Um, I always I always struggled tacking with um, with lots of bang on. Um, hence hence me not using a lot of bang. I kind of take the slack um, as I'm sailing upwind if it's uh, fairly fairly windy, but um, but uh, haven't haven't really used it to its probably to the normal effect of a bang. I know um, we have been thinking, or you know, Marco's been looking at doing um, using the bang a bit more, but um, but there's obviously you know makes it makes it harder to tack the boats or to 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 rotate the mast after the tack. Um, going on to the uh, rotation, my my rotation's semi limited that I can't get it as close to the centre line as I would have liked sometimes. Um, but the old rule of um, heading it heading towards the the front of the centre case or the or the side stays is kind of the general rule behind it it's for sailing upwind. Um, I don't know what um, what angle that would be. Yeah, I, I have the same sort of ballpark as um, my standard setting is the the four and a half plane of your mast. Uh, if you traced a line through it, it sort of ends up at the front of your lured centerboard case. Um, if I'm looking for a little bit of a flatter sail and a, a leech that's more open, I let the rotation go more. By that I mean I let that four and a half plane uh, go round to point more at the side stays. And what that does is it, it in rotating the mast more, it allows the, the sideways um, plane of the mast to bend more in a fore and aft direction with regard to your boom and sail. So in, a, in, a, in effect, that takes luff round out of your sail, makes it flatter um, and opens the leech more. So you can use that in the real, in the real light when you're struggling to get flow over your sail as, um, as let your rotation go more. So you've got more mass bend. Uh, and similarly, when you're overpowered and you want to get rid of some, you can let your rotation go more as well. But my, my standard setting is to start with the, the, the mast basically pointing at the front of your lured centerboard case and it's four and a half plane. There's been a few questions on the ro rotate, rotator and, and especially for off of the wind, but I think we'll get to that towards the, towards the end. Um, then the fourth day has a couple of uh, points that, that when uh, or when I used in a four state um, and is obviously in the ex in the extremes in the very light and and in the very windy um, it just bends the middle of the mast and takes some of the shape out um, when you when you don't when you don't need it and the really light stuff when the sails the masts are um, the mast are not bending they don't have the force on them. You can't shed on to bend the mast. Um, the sails end up, send, end up being quite full. Um, so using a little inner force day, we'll just pull the mast forward and um, flatten the sail and you'll get better flow attached to the main. Um, it also will just open the leech out a little bit um, and allow the flow to escape off quickly. Is, and, and that's what you'll be looking for. That's in the really light stuff. And then again in the windy, um, windy stuff. I haven't tend to use tended to use it as much in the real windy stuff um, because I feel the Cunningham um, is doing a lot of the work. Um, but I know from from what other people have said, and mainly with the mast without stiffness, it kind of helps the mast from not snapping downwind. So I kind of tend, when it's really windy, to use a little bit just for safety factor. I don't know, um, how Mark, anything to add on that or no, different you, ways of using it, it? You've got it spot on, you're exactly the same. There we go. And the um, upper and lower stays, I know traditionally they've been fairly loose with the um, mast without, without, um, without stiffness. Um, 
but with what I've found um, with with sale that we've got in this last stiffener, then you can use um, use quite a lot more tension on the on the stays. Um, you still need to be careful that you don't have too much on, and the mask you know it might restrict the mask from rotating, especially in the medium to light airs um, when you're looking for uh, maximum rotation, uh, mass rotation on the on the downwinds. Um, but generally speaking, um, I, I don't. I haven't found a good way of measuring it. Um, no, I don't haven't found a, a gauge that will measure it because they're still fairly loose. Um, so it's sort of more a feel thing. Um, but Having them, having them tight enough uh, that you um, are still not struggling to connect them when you're first putting the mast up. When I when I first got into the paper tiger class, this is the thing that did my head in, um, and and probably still does. You know, a lot of experienced guys will spend a heck of a lot longer than this webinar on the beach talking to you about. Um, the upper and lower stay tensions and, and what they should be. And most of the people in the class have stay adjusters. Some of them adjust them out on the water and the whole lot. And I just sort of wanted to keep it simple when I got into the class and I didn't really have a, a starting point. So I, I just set up with one rake that actually a, an experienced person in the class said, well, that looks about right. And then I just shackled my stays on and that's what I've done ever since. Um, just because I was wanting to reduce those variables. Uh, so I'm probably not particularly educated with regard to this one, but what I do know is that small changes make a big difference. And that includes changing your mast rake. So just be aware that if you change your mast rake, it, it alters the geometry of the way that your stays um, determine the way your mast bends. So you've just got to be really careful that you don't make one small change and then as a consequence, throw everything else out of whack. So um, that's why I just sort of decided I would just shackle my stays on and that's just how they are. And I stay with the same master rake as well, which for reference point is um, using that halyard measurement system uh, from the front to the back beam. My ballpark is 70, 75 mils. It just depends on how hard I pull the halyard. But that's what I started with when I first was in the got into the class five years ago, and it's still what I use today. Yeah, and I'm I'm pretty much exactly exactly the same on on rake wise, and that sort of um, just reinforces what Mark was saying before about keeping keeping note of um, what you, what you got because you know you got four stays to muck around with and. Like Mark said, says it's um, you know, you change change one thing, you change the front ones to change your rakes and and your and your back two go go slack. So you know you can you can definitely go around in circles pretty easily um, with with the uh, stay tensions if you haven't got a record of of what what you had before or what was good before. So move. To the next slide. I found this one from our nationals um, this year, and um, obviously on the left, left here we got um, two boats going upwind, and you can kind of see, um, especially from this lowered boat, nice and flat and twisted off on the leech. Travelers down quite a lot, um, and the boat looks pretty well balanced and pretty nice there. Um, the boat to windward, like I said, traveller's probably a little bit high. The sail's quite a lot fuller. Um, still twisted, but still generating a lot of power. And maybe that's because um, they've eased main sheet to try and um, depower rather than having the traveller down. It sort of just reinforces what we were sort of saying, um, saying earlier on that one. And and then the slight mm -hmm. photo. On the right, um, you can kind of see. I picked this one because when it when it does get quite light, the sails um, do tend to get quite full, as you can see around that bottom speed stroke, and and the leech 
is quite hooked down low. So that just sort of explains again what we were saying before of um, maybe using a little bit of inner force day, um, uh, not having that outhaul too eased in the really light stuff, um, just to try and um, get that lower leech uh, quite quite straight for the exit of the um, for the wind to exit off the back of the sail there. Just to add to that, one of the questions that people ask quite frequently is around you know your sail shape and how you set it up. Um, and the, the way you look at a sail, and it's great that what North sails all have is they have draft stripes at 25, 50, and 75% um, up, up the luff. And, and those draft stripes give you the reference point to look at both the, the camber, the depth of your sail, um, or the draft, uh, your, your draft position fore and aft, and, and your exit as well. So all of those things, as you get your eye into looking at the sail from on the boat and off the boat, look at your draft stripes. It's kind of easy to get distracted by the batten pockets, um, but of course the battens in all sails are in slightly different positions. In, in the, as Derek mentioned before, um, in the, the S5 uh, version, they're different than the S4 version. And uh, in terms of just a slight difference in the canting, canting of the batten pocket. So that can fool your eye. So keep your reference, the draft stripes. And just to reinforce the other thing that we were saying before, if you look at the left-hand photograph, you'll notice how straight the rigs are in the bottom half. And that's because that's where the stiffness sits. But it still allows the, um, the rig to dump off in the top half. Now, the boat on the right is the one that's still got a lot of main cheek tension on. Um, and you'll see that the mast bend is dumping the leech off. Whereas the, the boat following the white hulled boat, he's eased sheet a lot more. He has his traveler up more. So his sail's a lot fuller. And you'll see he doesn't have as much mast bend as well because he doesn't have the same leech tension on through his main sheet. So um, in my view, he's not going to be as quick in those conditions with moding his boat that way um, as the boat in the foreground. Hmm. Right up next, we got a uh, couple of short vids. Uh, this Marco, he'll, he'll um, tell you what's going on, but I think this was at the um, Minters in Napier, was it? Yeah, it was. It was before the start um, in the Inters and I was lining up against one of the young Aussie kids who was probably about 20 kilos lighter than me and I was just looking at how I might mode to hang on to him. Now, he was in a situation where he was sort of virtually hiking, um, certainly flying a hull and obviously I wasn't. So just trying to mode my boat to match him and I ended up being able to get it so that I could do that. But the other thing to, to just look at here is um, just how dynamic the sail is. It's quite flat water, but if you look carefully at the leech, you'll see the leech pumping in and out. And that's not me doing it, it's just the movement of the boat. So that has an influence on things too. Um, I mean, a lot of sailors will actually use kinetics to try and make that happen. Uh, but that, that can be quite a helpful thing just to exhaust and help um, with a little bit of power as you go over waves. Uh, as we come round to the windward side here, what you'll also notice is my body position. I'm not a long way inboard. I could be right in by the van trying to lift the windward hull. Um, the danger with doing that in the light is you do, even though you can lift your windward hull, you push your leeward hull into the water more, which does create some drag there. Um, but also you reduce your projected sail area because you're leaning your rig away from the wind. So if you're trying to find power and you're a heavier guy like I am um, in the light, uh, just be careful that you don't sort of get seduced into, uh, into trying to fly a hull and actually losing power as a consequence. Um, you're just trying to get into a situation where you can match or um, at least hang in there. So my philosophy when I'm not as fast as people who are lighter than me is I've just got to hang in there um, take the pain and try and minimize the damage and sail smart uh, to get a good keeper at the end of the race. Uh, so, so one of the questions we've got at, at, from people is, from heavier guys, how do you stay competitive with lighter guys, particularly in the lighter air? Um, so there are a couple of tips there that might help you and we'll deal with that a little bit more and, uh, as we come to the Q&A session. 
Mm. Yeah, no, that's pretty much exactly one of the things I was going to say. I know right at the start I was always trying to trying to lift that windward hull as soon as possible, and um, especially if there's any waves around, you 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 load up you load up that leeward hull quite a lot, and um, and you're pushing probably you're dragging more through the water, especially in in any waves, and the boat's just going to stop. So if you can um, like what Mark's doing there, kind of sitting um, just in on the tramp, just on the edge of the inner inner hull. Um, and, you know, if there is any little gusts, it will lift the hull, but, you know, it will reduce the drag, but it doesn't load up that leeward hull. Uh, this photo, this bit's me from, um, I think it was the Rotorua Sprint Regatta just sort of after the racing, um, just enough breeze to, um, to, to lift the hull, which is, is pretty nice sailing. Um, as, you, there's, as you can see, I try not to ease the main sheet too much. And there was a question about driving the boat round rather than um, trimming or vice versa. Um, if you can, drive the boat a little bit. Um, occasionally I get a little bit of height if the boat's healing too much, um, but you've got to be careful to bring the, um, bring the boat back down uh, before it starts slowing down. Um, because like we said before, as soon as you, you know, I probably don't have any bang on, as soon as I use my main sheet, the leech is going to um, loosen um, the mast will stand up, the sail will bag up, and um, and it's not going to be as fast. If you can just uh, flatten the boat by a small amount of um, of helm, just rounding up a little bit, um, and then as soon as you feel the windward hull coming back down, you're pulling you're pulling the boat away again. Um, you're bearing off to um, to power up the boat again. So. All the, all the time, you're kind of snaking your way up the beat um, in, in, um, in conjunction with the gusts. Yeah, be, be gentle in your helm movements when you're doing that though. Remember, every time you've got your rudder out of the fore and aft plane, it's drag. So you, you do, um, I, I absolutely agree with what Derek's saying, but you'll notice his helm movement's quite gentle in doing that. He's not sort of wiggling his tiller around um, and causing that extra drag. It's quite gentle uh, and subtle, that, that steering change. All right, now we'll get to, we've probably crossed off a lot of these questions already. Um, but these are the questions, uh, Few of the, or most of the questions that people were emailing in, which was great. Um, also, feel free to type something in the chat box if you've got something extra, and um, if we've got time, we'll get to it. We'll keep running for another 15 minutes or so. Um, well, we pretty much sorted the first um, one there, and we also talked about um, either keeping the, the main um, tight or easing it in the leech um, and we went through all the controls there. Um, as the wind progressively increases, can please describe what changes are made sailing, um, upwind angles, control trim. Um, we went through briefly the controls um, again um, as, as the wind and the waves increase um, you, you won't be able to sail as high, um, so you do need to adjust for that. Um, but again, even in the really windy stuff, I'm always, um, you know, dri driving the boat around, um, you know, in the gusts and trying to control the, um, the amount of heel that I have. Um, you know, you can only hike as hard as you can hike, um, and the rest has to be done either with, um, feathering um, or, or steering the boat up a little bit um, and your controls. 
Yeah, I think those three bullet points there um, uh, from um, bullet point three down to bullet point five are all sort of related to the same thing. And um, there, as you'll all be aware, there's no one thing uh, or no one magic thing that's going to make you really quick. It's a combination of little things. So your, your helming is quite important, uh, particularly when you've got waves. So in the paper tiger, when you're flying a hull, um, you do tend to punch your lured bow into waves and that's really slow. So one thing I see some skippers doing is, is moving quite a long way back in the boat to stop that happening. But then sometimes they're actually either dragging the back of the boat, uh, dragging the, the transom down, or if it's really windy, if you get the bow up too much, you get a lot of windage under your tramp, particularly as you go over waves. And you might have even felt that yourself as you go over a wave, the boat sort of almost does a bit of a, a handbrake kind of turn and stops or slows down. So uh, what I try to do is to stay a, a bit further forward in the boat, but I use my body weight through my hiking and my shoulders to try and lift the leeward bow over the waves. So uh, I tend to be a little bit more physical in the boat when, in terms of my hiking technique in waves so that I'm trying to reduce the risk of that leeward hull punching through waves going upwind and, and slowing the boat but not sitting so far back that the bow's so the boat's so bow up that you end up with it kind of um, dragging in the stern and having that windage issue that comes from having a lot of breeze going under the tramp. Yeah, exactly right. Like it's it's no different to a mono hull or any other dinghy that you've sailed. You know, right from right from the beginning beginning of boats. You know. Um, Using your body fore and aft to um, work the work the boat over the um, over the waves is is really important. And again, I do I do a lot as well. Um, the boats are only fifty kilos; they're quite light uh, boats. You know, one, we've got a boat in New Zealand, the Starling. Well, that's 40, 42, 45 kilos, and that's um, for for kids, and and it's a lot shorter. So the boats are extremely light. So your your body can control quite a lot of what of what the um, what the boat's going to going to do. Yeah, one thing related to that, and and it, it's not to be disrespectful to anybody, but I do see some people sort of bent leg hiking on the paper tiger, which you can do when you're flying a hull. You know, you can drop your bum down and sit it against the top sides. And it's probably a little bit more comfortable, but but that completely reduces your ability to do what Derek and I have just been talking about, and that's to use your body um, physically to actually lift your bow over waves, which requires a more straight leg hiking technique. So um, that of course requires you to have good core fitness, um, good quad strength uh, to be able to do that. But but it's faster. Um, right down to we, Mark kind of briefly talked about um, this next one. If I weigh 80, 85 kilos, how can how how do I get PT to perform in sub flying hull conditions? Um, like we saw in the video, and like what Mark said, I'm pretty sure that's nearly exactly the Mark, Marco's weight. Um, we had. Uh, Two days of fairly light sub sub hull flying conditions at nationals, and um, Mark was right up there. You know, just trying to do everything he can to um, minimise um, any damage if if he was feeling a little bit slower. Um, mm. Yeah, it's exactly right, and and I sort of described it. So I'm I'm 80 kilos, so. Um, I am heavier than, than some of the people who certainly those guys who are really quick in the light and when they can fly a hell and I can't, it, it's, it's really difficult. But I just try to hang in there and, and get a keeper and sail smart, um, keep good clear lanes, good clear air, uh, try and sort of not get too frustrated. The other thing that, that of course is, is more likely in lighter conditions than heavier conditions is you're more likely to have wind shifts and um, puffs and lulls and and so you can use your smarts to try and hang in there too uh, just to make sure you're positioning yourself 
as best as possible on the racetrack to take advantage of, of whatever variation there is. Um, and that's another thing that, that you can do to try and minimize the disadvantage that you're at. And of course, at the, at the other end of the scale, when it's windy, well, you try and punish the, the lighter guys and, and, and get um, as much advantage as you can. So I'm, I'm unashamed in the way that I kind of approach my sailing. I, I'm very careful, for example, that if it's in the light and it's marginal half line, I don't want to come off the start line with a guy 10, 15, 20 kilos lighter than me just to lure it or just to win with, because I know I'm going to get rolled, right? So you try and pick a spot on the start line where you minimize the risk of taking that pain. And the converse is also true. If it's windy, 18, 20 knots, I have no problem starting to windward or immediately to leeward of a guy who's 60 kilos. Um, because I know that I'm going to have a lane I can punch out and take advantage of, of my situation in those conditions. So um, that's not to be mean. It's, it's, just, it's just yacht racing. Uh, so exactly. those are some of the ways I approach it. Yeah, and it's just doing those those little things, um, making sure you're getting getting off the line in a good position, um, working out the favoured side of the line. You know, doing everything you can that's that's kind of neutral to to all the boats, regardless of weight. Um, picking the right time to tack. Uh, you know, if there's some bad waves, obviously just go a bit further. You know, we we, we all know how how much the um, tacking is costly in the paper tiger so um it's just all these little things that you can do um to reduce any any deficit um another one we had uh, what ideas do you have to reduce the time of the last pt behind you to even up the fleet well um well we're doing we're doing this we're doing these little talks. Um, I've helped out the guys in Christchurch um, for a weekend coaching, uh, and I know Mark is, and myself and any any other top guys here in New Zealand and over in Australia will be more than happy to um, feed you information or tell you what they're doing if they're going fast. Um, it's all about educating everyone. And um, it's pretty much all we can, all we can do is help out as much as we can. I know. Yeah, I think it's one of the great things about the Paper Tiger Fleet is people are so open and willing to help and coach. So if you if you're struggling and you're not sure, just ask somebody. I, I don't know anybody in the PT fleet who's not going to give you some genuine advice that might be helpful. The other thing I think is really important is, is to race uh, as much as you can and particularly to, to race against the good guys as much as you can. And that's one of the things we're very lucky in New Zealand. I know one of the challenges in the Aussies is you, you're so far spread apart that you really only get to check in with all the top guys once a year. Whereas in New Zealand here, we're doing it six, seven, eight times a year. Um, and that allows us to push each other hard and to continue to improve. But um, racing against the best people, um, watching them, listening to them, keeping the log books and being professional about the way you approach your sailing. So you're trying to make little improvements all the time. You're not kind of getting seduced into trying to find a silver bullet that you're going to just have one thing that's going to suddenly make you a legend, um, spoke speed wise. You're just understanding that you've just got to make those little incremental gains and keep trying to improve all the time. Um, and eventually those little things add up to you being quite competitive. So we have a guy in our fleet, I hope he won't mind me mentioning his name, Mark Jones, who, who's made a massive improvement over the last year just by doing that. You know, he's upgraded some equipment, he's thought about it, he's lost a bit of weight, he's got fitter, and suddenly he's knocking on the door of the top 10. So, so it can be done, um, and there are people in the class who are more than willing to help you. And um, the last one I think we covered uh, was the dip wind. How much do you think that helmet to neck would just main sheet body movement? Well, we, yeah, we talked about that and doing doing everything to work the boat over the waves and um, and and as much as you can there. Um, just quickly, 
we had uh, a couple of couple come through here. Um, if I get a new sale, what are the tips of changing mask to fit? Well, first, if you decide which which sale maker to go with, then that's kind of going to determine which what what you do with your mask, um, depending on what they cut the the sale for, or 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 um, if they can do it for whatever. We've obviously um, most of us have gone down the a route with the with the carbon stiffness, so um, so you know we we've, we've got so much information on on um, on how to make that how how to make the best fit um, with with the sale and the mask combo. So there's there's um, there's really good a um, uh, really good document um, uh, one of the guys sent me. Uh, to to fit the um, the carbon stiffener in the mask, which is um, really well put out, and I've sent it on to quite a few people to help them fit fit the stiffeners as well. So um, there's heaps of heaps of info there on all that. Yeah, I think you start start with the mask as the answer that answer that question, rather than getting a, a new sale and then trying to make your mask fit your sale. Do it the other way around. Um, any mm. decent sale maker, when when they're talking to you about the design and the sale you want, they're going to ask you questions about your mask that you're going to fly the sale on. So um, you need to to think about what you want to and try and achieve. Uh, and and if you're going to do a stiffener, then you can get some basic measurements from that by just uh, putting your mask um, on a couple of saw horses, the top and bottom, and and hanging say a, a 10 or 20 kilo weight through the middle and, and taking some measurements with a string line down it just to get an idea of what that mast bend profile is. And that's at least a starting point. Um, then that's important in terms of the, the overall design of the sail, which is quite a complex combination of, of seam shape, panel layout, um, bluff round, those kinds of things. All right, just the last slide really. Um with the questions that came in regarding downwind. Um, having trouble speed on the reaches, light medium ears. How should I set the boat up? Well, I think most most of these all sort of um, similar similar ones. How to how much kicker to use? Um, to determine spend any effort determining the amount of boom push you have um, and I had to get Scott to explain that there's uh, yeah um, well, so, where so the main what, what that, are. What, yeah what that's talking about there is if you've got your main sheet pulleys on your boom um, further aft as as you let your sail out and it, well even if it's in if your main sheet pulleys are a long way back when you use main sheet tension that's driving your boom forward and potentially inducing more mast bend lower down. Um, I don't think with a stiffener in the bottom of your mast, that's as big a deal as it once was. Uh, but I also note that some people like Hayden, for example, uh, rather than having double or triple blocks on the boom, he actually has three single blocks that are spread out quite a long way. And so that spreads the load a lot more and reduces that boom push situation. Uh, but if you do have a softer rig, certainly the, the boom push and inducing lower mass bend is going to drop power because it takes away luff round, it flattens your sail, it opens your leech, and it's going to be slower on the reach because you're not going to generate as much power. So one of the biggest advantages I found, and it wasn't actually the reason that I put the, the stiffener in the rig in the first place, um, but of course it had the, the benefit of just generating so much more work on the reaches. And so that allowed me to just use that power um, to drive much lower with than, than other people could and still fly a hull in, in marginal conditions, for example. So uh, I think that's a sort of unintended but very definite advantage of having a stiffer rig in the bottom third uh, through the stiffer stiffener is it just allows you to wick up your sail and, and be much quicker downwind, certainly reaching. Mm. Um, so yeah, there's quite a few on how much, how to determine the right amount of kicker, how much controls to use. 
Um, if it's if it's quite a tight ridge, and you don't have to, you can just ease the traveller to the to the corner right down, and you don't have to ease any main. Then that's pretty easy. You don't need any any vang. It's kind of like upwind. Your main sheet's doing all the work. Um, as soon as you have to ease the boom, boom further off the corner of the boat than the traveller, uh, that's when you start to start to need the bang on. Um, if you don't have any on or you don't have enough, the leech is going to be too twisted and it's going to be spilling, uh, spilling a lot of the air and um, yeah, spilling a lot of the air out of the sail. So again, um, the leech wallies, the leech ribbons on the back of the main are a very good telltale on that, um, pulling a little bit of um, cutting them on, uh, sorry, the bang on to control that uh, control that leech. The other thing that I just mentioned, and it's not about setup, it's actually about technique. Um, I I've learned that for the paper tiger, the use the ability to use apparent wind angle and apparent wind strength is is a huge uh, step forward, reaching particularly in light to medium airs. Um, and that's the top bullet point question. So by that, I mean, you can come up higher and generate more power. And as a consequence, you generate more speed. As a consequence, you bring the apparent wind direction forward and that generates more apparent wind speed and that makes you go faster and then you can bear away with that. So I spend a lot of time um, S-curving especially in waves on reaches to try and generate a parent and then bring that apparent down. And then when I start to lose it to come back up again. Um, and with regard to that, I, I'm surprised it's perhaps a natural thing. How many times when we go out training, we just go upwind and then dead downwind, upwind and then dead downwind. We don't practice reaching enough. The courses that we sail in triangles, especially if we do a double triangle, if you think about it, there are four reaches. And they're very, very important, but we don't practice them much. The other thing is often when we do practice them, we're not sailing to a mark. We're just going reaching. And it's easy to kid yourself by going higher than somebody else and thinking you're matching them. So you have to pick a mark to reach to and, and then to, to just practice that. So like all things, if you're going to get better at it, you've got to think about it. You've got to get set up right. And then you've got to practice it and try and learn how to do it better. So I would recommend that when you do go out training, um, don't forget that you need to practice reaching because it's a big part of our, our racing in the Paper Tiger class. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's easy to just go out, go out sailing without a plan or, or go upwind for a bit and come back down. Um, and, you know, it, it, is, it is hard to, to simulate the um, angle of the of the race of the reach in a race, but um, if there are marks or anything out there, sort of get yourself in a good upwind position and and um, and then in aim for the mark. Whether it's tight, broad, really broad, um, it's gonna it's gonna help. Um, this one here, sailing square down downwind or deep broad reach, and you've lost leeward. Flow, what are you looking for in the sail shape? Well, um, is this, is, sorry, is that dead downwind? I think it's both. Um, so the, the, if you lose Lewis flow, you've stalled the sail, right? And so there, there's two reasons why that happens. If it's, if it's really light winds and your sail's super deep, um, you just, the breeze just hasn't got enough velocity to make it all the way over that curvature on the leeward side. So the answer to that is you need to flatten your sail. Um, and you can do that in the same way as you flatten your sail upwind with the exception of, I, I wouldn't be flattening your sail look, using your van um, dead downwind or on a broad reach. But I would be looking at doing things like pulling your inner four stay on. Uh, I'd be looking at pulling your out all in. Uh, and just doing things that allows you to still have a leech that's reasonably um, loose, so it's not hooked, uh, but that you're flattening the profile or the draft of your sail so that you've got enough 
um, ability to get low wind speed to flow all the way across your sail uh, from, from luff to leech. Um, the other thing that I would do is I would come up a little bit and generate that flow and then that apparent and then take that off down to lure it again. So that is curving approach in terms of technique. Right. Uh, when, when would you invert the mass bend to open the leech for match, maximum projection? Um, these last two kind of go together on on our on our views and what are your views on the leech cords? Well, I've tried I've tried to invert the mast um, downwind, but really struggled to be able to do it effectively. Um, and I think it's something um, with the stiffness in this in the masts now. It's the masts aren't bending as much down low, so you don't get that. Um, you don't get that movement, um, and uh, and the and the mast is stiffer, so you're kind of um, you've you've got quite a lot of projection anyway. Mark might probably be able to elaborate yeah, more on I, that. When I first started in the class, I, I watched people um, sail downwind, especially in the light. This is this is dead downwind running. Um, and they'd, they'd pull their Cunningham or downhaul on. And I sort of thought, well, that doesn't make sense. I'd never seen that before. But what I, when I questioned and looked at it, what they were trying to do is to do exactly what this bullet point is asking. And that is to bend the mast more, take some luff round um, and put a greater projected area out there. But as Derek said, I just don't find that that works with stiffer rigs. Um, you can pull, a, pull the Cunningham on, but it's really not doing a heck of a lot. What I will, will do, especially if it's light, is I'll pull my out all tighter um, so that you, you just, again, are trying to take a bit of depth out of your sail to get flow. The other part for downwind sailing, I think, especially in the light, is you do need to have flow, either leech to luff, so sailing by the lee, or luff to leech, heating it up a little bit, as opposed to just poking it dead downwind and not having the ability for the, the limited breeze to actually get flow across your sail. Um, jumping into the leech cords thing, um, I've heard this quite a lot. Uh, my, on my view on it, uh, and until I see somebody go past me on a reach with a leech cord on, I'll, I'll hold to it, is, is I've asked the question, well, why do you want to use a leech cord? And for me, the answer to that is because you want to tighten up the leech on your sail so that you get more power. So then is, well, why do you need to tighten up the leech on your sail? And the answer to that is because your mast's too soft. So um, having the stiffness in your rig, I think sort of negates the need for a leech cord. The other thing I'd put into it is, I don't know any high performance class in the world that uses a leech cord. Uh, so I've heard it particularly from some of the Australians and some people seem to still subscribe to it. Um, I've not tried it, I have to say, so I'm sort of talking from a position of ignorance here, um, but, but uh, that's my view on it for what it's worth. And, um, one day I'll be proved wrong, and then the next day you'll find me with a leech cord on, perhaps. But uh, well, until I see it, I, I, I'm kind of not a believer. Yeah, um, exactly. I'm in the same view of um, having having the mass stiffer. Um, you're not getting that sideways bend as as much sideways bend as you do without the stiffener. Um, so the mast is holding the um, holding the leech tight, um, and you're getting and you're getting uh, enough power power there um, already compared to um, having a bendy mast with you know back in the day a soft Dacron sail um, that would would bag open and you needed a way to close that. Um, I think the um, the stiffer cloth that we're using and um, and the carbon battens kind of restrict restrict the um, the leech cord from working anyway. Um, but yeah, I don't feel it's needed in in a, in a, in a sail with a with a mast stiffener. But yeah, like Mark says, there's a lot of people that still swear by it. Um, and if, if you think it makes a difference, then that's got to be good. 
Um, so yeah. Um, just one more that came through about mass stiffener lengths. Um, having a longer one here at 4.2 meters. Um, like like um, Steve said here, there's advantages and disadvantages. Yep, it's going to make a stiffer mast. Um, you you'll hold more power. Uh, um, uh, we feel the downside of that is it adds a lot of weight and a lot of weight up high. Um, it's kind of what we've been trying to get rid of um, with the sail, and um, any weight up high is is compounded with you know healing moment. Uh, so it's just going to make it harder. And also, like Mark said right at the start, a six and a half meter mast, you get a lot of pitching. So if you have um, a heavy stiffener or a long stiffener, then you're going to get a lot of hobby horsing um, and, and you're adding a lot of weight. Yep, agreed. That's the biggest trade-off. And that's probably why Steve's uh, question around a, a really long stiffener, um, it has advantages and disadvantages. And, and as we find with almost everything in sailing, there's, there's no free lunch, right? You're going to have something that helps in some conditions, but hurts you in others, or is quicker upwind, but it's slower downwind, or um, quicker in the flat water, but slower in, in, in the chop. So there are trade-offs. And you know, I've got two rigs, one with a, a long stiffener and one with a shorter stiffener, and same thing. Sometimes one's better than the other, um, but for me, my the biggest trade-off for me is the one that Derek referred to, and that's the weight up high that I notice. The boat just feels different with the longer stiffener in it, and it's because of the weight up high. It just feels less lively, um, doesn't accelerate as well, and especially I feel it's got a penalty when there are waves not so bad in the flat water but as soon as there are waves the boat just sort of bounces too much and it's it's slower as a consequence right so um so bruce definitely thinks that the leech cords are beneficial in the north sail so so that's um that's one one for that side <laughs> Right, that um, that brings us to the end of our little chat. Unless anyone's got any other um, questions they want to fire through. Yeah, good on you, everybody out there. Um, in PT world, it's uh, it's a great class to be a part of, and um, these sort of contributions uh, are, are wonderful opportunities uh, for you Aussies. We're really looking forward to catching up with you guys again at the next internationals and um and if you've got questions from over there that that we can help with don't hesitate to ask and for us kiwis now that we're able to get back on the water it's not that cold yet so it'd be great to get out there and um get the pts wet again and scare some of the spiders and cockroaches out that have uh, found their way into our boats so um <laughs> it's been a pleasure thanks for inviting me des i've enjoyed it it's been nice to kind of get the head into to pt world again Ah, oh, brilliant, brilliant. Uh, thank you, Mark, for all your words of wisdom. And um, and yes, this has been recorded, and will be um, this will be up on our YouTube channel. Um, so YouTube, um, Google YouTube North Sales, and you should be able to find it. it should be up in a couple of days. So um, no, brilliant. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs>